Dear brothers, sisters, and friends, uh, apologies first that uh, I have to stand here at this pulpit. I'm used to doing that. <laughs> I would have sat down like uh, my friend Dr. Vendley and simply discussed with you. That's my first apology. My second apology is that my sacred journeys have taken me through terrains that are probably unfamiliar to most of you here. Therefore, I plead that you be patient with me if I say, talk about things that maybe you are not familiar with. But since the organizers of uh, the Festival of Faiths have sent their invitation way down to Nigeria and to me to come, and I agreed to come, you didn't have to listen to what I have to say. <laughs> I thank the Center for Interfaith Relations for inviting me to be part of this year's Festival of Faiths. The theme of Sacred Journeys and the Legacy of Thomas Merton is quite inspiring. Although I know about Thomas Merton, I do not know too much about his sacred journeys, except that I know he lived his Catholic religious life in a most challenging and extraordinary way. I hope that by the time I leave here, I will be more informed and better edified, and I'm already being so. The letter inviting me asked for a short talk about my personal sacred journey, and that is precisely what I intend to do. But before saying anything more, let me warn you that my sacred journey is not likely to be anywhere near the level of excitement like that of Thomas Merton, or even that of uh, Dr. Ventley. Mine is rather a very normal and ordinary one, as you will soon find out. I thank the organizers for challenging me to tell my story. It is a story that I have really not told much to myself in the past. And my preparing for this talk has helped me to understand myself better than before. In my story, the story that I will tell, in line with the general intentions of this festival, I will focus very much on the aspects of my sacred journey that uh, have disposed me to an interest in and a concern about interfaith relations. I can now clearly see the hand of the Almighty God guiding and guarding me all along the way. Let me start from the beginning, my origins. I was born to first-generation Catholic parents who were adult converts from our African traditional religions. My father and my mother met each other in the catechism class as they were being instructed in the faith in preparation for baptism. They embraced the Christian faith at a time when our village community was largely following the religions of our ancestors. They used to call them pagans. They are not. This was about the year 1930. It is significant to note that at the time when my parents decided to become Christians in the Catholic Church, some of their siblings and relations, uncles of mine, made different faith choices. The result is that I grew up with uncles and aunties who belonged to different faith traditions. Some went to the main Protestant church in our village, the Anglican Church, which was then under the CMS, Church Missionary Society, an uncle of mine became a Muslim at the same time. 
but most of the senior members of my father's family did not change their faith orientation. They remained faithful to the religion of our ancestors. You would say in those days, they remained pagans. It meant, therefore, that I was born into a family. Now, family in the wide sense of the word, not just me, my father, my mother. Family meaning the whole extended family. I was born into a family where differences in religion did not affect our sense of unity as a family. We celebrated one another's festivals. And as children, we look forward to every religious celebration and festivity. Second, my faith, my early experience. My first and main childhood experience in my spiritual journey was obviously that of a pre-Vatican II Catholic Church. The Catholic Church to which I was born and in which I was raised was a church run by Irish missionaries who brought the Irish brand of the Catholic Church firmly on ground among our people. In fact, in Nigeria, we call Ireland our fathers in the faith. Maybe also our mothers. But at the same time, I was very familiar with the festivals of our African traditional religion. It could be said that at that time, the official religion, if you could call such, in the community was precisely our African traditional religion to which the village king belonged and which he led. I can still remember the deep impressions made on us children in the various festivals of this traditional religion, which at that time was considered, as I fully said, pagan. Then apart from the African traditional religion, we were also familiar with the Islamic faith. I vividly remember the Muslim town crier as early as 4 a.m., going around the little village in the month of Ramadan, waking up the women to get up and prepare breakfast before the sunrise. There was no significantly visible uh, Muslim community in our town. The few Muslims said their prayers happily and freely in the little village community. Most of the Muslims in my village were not indigents of our town. They were largely traders and low-grade civil servants working for the then colonial local government from tribes nearer to us, like the Nupes Igalas. I remember only one family among our village people, namely my uncle's family, who had adopted the Islamic faith. Another part of my early childhood experience is my spirit, in my spiritual journey was the presence of what later on came to be called the African Independent Churches, which used to go under the name of Aladura Church, a name which translates from Yoruba as the church of those who pray. They went under the name, today, they go under the name today of Christ Apostolic Church. They are not exactly like your evangelicals or Pentecostals here. They are a Christian faith that, came, that, were, that were founded by charismatic Nigerian, especially Yoruba Christians who adopted much of the Old Testament and much of our Nigerian culture and traditions. I remember being woken up in the middle of the night by the prophetess who marched around the village ringing her bell and shouting, which translates from Yoruba as, listen to the message of the Lord, the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. Looking back now, I am surprised that nobody molested this prophetess for disturbing our peace and our sleep. Her name was Prophetess Phoebe. After the woman Phoebe, 
mentioned in St. Paul in his letter to the Romans. Apart from prophetess Phoebe and her announcements with Bell at, at dawn, there was also the vigorous and regular worship service in the little church behind my father's house, both in the morning and in the evening. Unlike in our Catholic church where we prayed in the old pre-Vatican fashion and sang only Latin songs, Gloria and Credo, and poor Yoruba translations of Irish and French hymns, <laughs> uh, la, 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 etc. Unlike that, the worship in the Aladura church behind my father's house was very lively and vigorous with Yoruba music, with dancing, drumming, and singing. Even their songs clearly declared that they were worshiping God with dancing and singing, which was not in the Catholic church, not even in the Anglican church. They were worshiping God with dancing and singing and drumming because that is what the Bible says in Psalm 150. Uh, every time I read Psalm 150, I remember the music behind my father's house. In all this, as a child, I got used to taking it for granted that there are many ways of serving and worshiping God, already at that level. Growing up familiar with other faiths, that's number three. As I, and so I grew up deeply rooted in the Catholic faith. My father was the head and the leader of the small, growing Catholic community in the village. He had the title of Baba Egbe, which translates as the father of the community. He was not the parish priest. He was the, head of the, he was the leader of the lay faithful. And the parish priest will do wise to listen to the head of the lay faithful. My father was not just the father of the community. He was indeed a man of faith in the most genuine sense of the word. He raised his family as a very devout Catholic family. Every morning, we woke up as early as 5 o'clock in the morning for morning prayer. And then, we were pushed on to go to, to, and we went on foot, trekked the distance of about 30 minutes to the church for mass every morning. We did not sleep until we had a, a 40 minute long night prayer rosary, and a whole series of uh, prayers. We are all familiar with the Catholic Church, its teachings, its practices. Looking back now, I can say that our parents were not only devout in religious practices, but also clear witnesses of the Catholic way of life. We, the children, learned this way of life by both words and practical example. Naturally therefore, naturally, therefore, as early as possible, I became an altar boy. I was proud to become one of the few of those in those days able to engage in Latin dialogue with the parish priest who said the mass in Latin with his back to the congregation. I admired the Irish priests, and they were very kind to us little children. It didn't take too much. It didn't take much to make us happy. A, a, a little sweet here and there, and we, we felt very happy. It was in those early years, at about the age of nine or ten, that I first met a Nigerian Catholic priest, Reverend Father Stephen Umurie, who, was, who also won my deep admiration. We children called him Father Dudu, which means the black father that I saw a Nigerian as a Catholic priest engendered in me the desire to become one. Earlier on, I had often played in our living room with vessels and cups pretending to be saying mass like I saw the priest doing. Now it was a concrete desire. Let me add here that despite our familiarity with people of other religions and our deep regard and respect for them, somehow, as a child, I felt rather sorry for my non-Catholic friends. I was somehow worried 
that they may be missing the way to heaven. This was before Vatican II, when it was a major tenet of the Catholic faith that outside the Catholic Church, salvation is at the best most uncertain and at worst quite impossible. Today, a lot of water had passed under the bridge. For my secondary school days, you will say secondary school is after primary school. I left home to a faraway boarding school. Again here, God was guiding my steps. I had a choice to accept a government scholarship to a government secondary school or to a Catholic boarding school, St. Michael's Secondary School, a lady. Already at that early age of 11, in 1956, I had such a strong desire for a deep Catholic life that I clearly expressed the preference to go to the Catholic school rather than to the government school, even though the Catholic school was going to be more difficult for my parents in terms of fees and expenses. Already at that time, I could not imagine myself being in a boarding school where there would be no daily holy mass, not to talk of Sunday mass. That's how I ended up in St. Michael's. Under the very careful, loving, but firm management of the English Holy Ghost Fathers. I was raised by the Irish SMA, Society of African Missions Fathers. And I went to school with the English Holy Ghost Fathers. And therefore, I played cricket. <laughs> I still remember vividly my relationship with all those English missionaries who taught us with admirable dedication and competence. Incidentally, they also came with lay teachers who themselves were missionaries of some sort. That was at a time when it was difficult to find Nigerians with university degrees competent to teach in the secondary school. All through the six years, from the age of 11 to the age of 17, I enjoyed the very Catholic environment of our college. And during that time, my desire for the priesthood continued to linger, and I would say also deepened. From point of view of interfaith relations, my secondary school had very little to do with non-Catholics. It was clearly a Catholic school for Catholics. But there was the significant exception of one or two Muslims in this school. I remember in particular my friend. His name is Sabo Agu. He must have come from a very deeply convinced Muslim family because even while he was in the very midst of a Catholic school, he insisted to do his best to live up to the tenet of his faith. Two issues remained strong in my mind today about my friend Sabo Agu. The first had to do with Hilal food. The school's kitchen used to buy goats from the villagers, from the village around, which were then slaughtered for the food of the students. In order not to eat any meat not properly slaughtered, Sabo Ago took it upon himself to make sure that he would slaughter every animal that was going to be cooked for us students, to make sure that the food he ate was ritually clean. What was more interesting was that if for whatever reason Sabo Ago was not available when it was time to slaughter the animals and other people slaughtered it, he would not eat on that day because he had no, no other alternative. There was no plan B for him. At least he would not eat from the general kitchen pot. The second case that remained strong in my mind was how tenaciously he observed the fasting during the month of Ramadan. Since the student's kitchen would not make any provisions for him alone to go to the kitchen and prepare food at 4 o'clock so that he can finish food before 6, nobody was ready to do that for him alone, he would take food items the night before, wake up early in the morning, warm his food, and eat his early breakfast 
before sunrise. I used to secretly marvel at this young man who throughout the day will neither eat nor drink, but who will continue to do everything like the rest of us, be it manual labor or sports. It is important to note that this was in a Catholic school, and the school authorities, who were missionaries and Catholic priests, did nothing to stop the Muslim students from living according to their faith within the general good order of the school. This was all the most significant as this was well before Vatican II. Several years later, I have opportunities to meet Saboago. I was already a bishop and he was a high government official. We embraced each other with great joy. We had a nice time talking about the good old days in the secondary school, a school of which he was always proud. I did not fail to remind him of his slaughtering of animals and his efforts during the Ramadan. It was after the secondary school that the great moment of decision came, what to do with my life. I finally, I finally decided to take the necessary step towards achieving my desire to be a Catholic priest. I gave up the chances of continued education in the government higher school in preparation for university and put myself at the disposal of the bishop who sent me to the major seminary in preparation for the priesthood. There was a small dialogue between me and my bishop, who, by the way, was a Canadian Holy Ghost father, Bishop DeLille of blessed memory, a father to me. When I presented myself to him, I said, Bishop, I want to be a priest. But I have got this scholarship to go to the best government college in Nigeria. And this is all free of charge. What am I to do? And Bishop looked me straight in the eyes and said, John, you want to be a priest? From now on, you do whatever I tell you. And I said, yes, my Lord. It was a lesson taken very early. And that lesson stayed with me and probably still stays with me until now. John. You do whatever I tell you. Incidentally, when I became a bishop, my motto was, thy will be done. Fiat voluntas tua. Priestly formation. I was trained for the priesthood for two and a half years in Nigeria and four years in Rome. This was an exciting period following immediately the Second Vatican Council. That was between 1963 and 1969. It was a period of a changing church. It meant that we were trained to be open to change in the church. How far will the change go or can go, we was never really clear to us. In particular, we had to deal with the changing attitude of the Catholic Church, not only in respect of relationship with other Christians in the ecumenical movement, but also and especially in relations to other faiths. The Vatican Council itself came up with the most, with the special document on relationship with non-Christian religions. This was the beginning of a general policy of respectful attitude to followers of other faiths. I want to refer to three of these basic documents of the Council. The first, Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution of the Church, opened up the theological mind of the Catholic Church in a positive attitude to others outside the church. Noteworthy was the broad view of the people of God, which was a main thrust of that document. We are very familiar with all this by now, but when I was a seminarian, it was all very new and hot stuff. The second was the document Unitatis Ied Integratio on ecumenical relations with other Christian communities. But the third, and of particular significance for our present discussion, was Nostra Etate, on the relations of the church to non-Christian religions. And this was the foundational document for the now well-known Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. You could add on to this, that document, Dignitatis Humanae, on 
religious freedom. Although Vatican II spoke of all non-Christian religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, and so on, for me, two were of particular relevance, namely Islam and our traditional religions. The council had a lot to say about Islam. While acknowledging the turbulent history of our past relations, the council called for a change of attitude in the direction of mutual understanding and cooperation. And the church has been following this path since the past 50 years. But more interesting for me was how Vatican II finally gave me a serene appreciation of the spiritual values of the religion of my ancestors. Even though it was one little nebulous sentence in Nostra Etate, but that was enough for me. Up until then, I had problem reconciling myself with what was the general attitude that my ancestors were worshiping idols, rivers and streams, statues and hills. Vatican II opened the door for me to be able to respect the religion of my ancestor who worshiped the true God, even though they reached him through different images and pictures. It was be the beginning of a long journey, my sacred journey, where I grew in the knowledge of the, and the love of God, carrying along not only my Christian faith, but also my cultural religious roots. You could say, I always tell everybody, if you are asking for what has happened to the African traditional religion, I tell them, please look at me. I'm carrying it with me. A young priest, a young priest at home. After studies in Rome, I came home for ordination to the sacred priesthood in August 1969. My ordination was a celebration for the entire village community, irrespective of faith affiliation. In 1969, uh, Catholic priestly ordinations were very, very rare things. It was a national event. I can still remember my pagan uncle proudly seated in the front rows, front pews of the church, watching the proceedings with very keen interest. After the mass, he held my hand, looked into my eyes, and said, my son, you've done very well. In our family, whatever we start to do, we do it very well. He was not a Catholic. He never, he never became Christian. He remained in the religion of our ancestors. But he was proud of his son, who became a Catholic, and not just became a Christian, but even became a Catholic priest. My first two years at home were characterized by zeal and joy in the work that I was doing as a young priest. I was 25 years old. It was also a time when I already got involved in the area of education and formation of priests. The first year gave me opportunity to get involved with secondary school education to young boys in a public school, and the second year to training young aspirants to the priesthood in the junior seminary. But there were also, at the, big, at the background, the challenges of working out, in practical terms, the new ideas about the relations of the church to people of other faiths. It was a constant learning experience. Then, back to Rome for higher studies. Soon, within two years, I was sent back to Rome for higher studies in scripture and theology, both at the Biblical Institute and in my doctoral studies at the Urbaniana University, my interest grew on interreligious issues. This was brought out clearly in the theme of my doctorate thesis, where I analyzed in a comparative study the priesthood in ancient Israel before the monarchy and the priesthood in the religion of my ancestors of our village. This is not the place to explain what I said. But this gave me opportunity to study more deeply the spiritual values of ancient Israel, which continues today in the Jewish faith, and of the religions of our ancestors in the African traditional religions. Return home. Coming home finally in January 1976, I became fully involved 
in priestly formation, first in the junior seminary for a year, and later in the major seminary. This period of six to seven years were characterized by continued studies of Christian theology in the African context. We used to talk then of contextual theology. The focus in my case was in two main directions. First, the study of religions, especially as they affect our living together with people of other faiths in our country, Nigeria. The second was the impact of the Christian faith on sociopolitical, mat sociopolitical matters as guided by the Catholic social doctrine. It is significant that it was at this point that I was given the great honor of being a member of the International Theological Commission, which is a group of 30 theologians chosen from all over the world. The late Saint Pope John Paul II appointed me to the group. I was the only African, in fact, the only black face in the group. But I believe it was not just to add color to the commission that <laughs> must have been for some other reasons. At the same time, too, the Holy See made me a member of the International Catholic Methodist Dialogue Commission. That brought me to the United States a few times, especially to their headquarters in North Carolina, Lake in Alaska, of the World Methodist Council. I also got myself involved in various academic theological associations, especially the Catholic Theological Association of Nigeria, Katan, the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians, ITWAT, and the Nigerian Association for the Study of Religions, that's Interfaith. All these provided the opportunity to meet and interact with theological colleagues from different faith traditions. Then the Episcopacy. By August 1989, Pope St. John Paul II appointed me a bishop at the age of 38. First auxiliary and later ordinary of the Diocese of Ilori. My experience in Ilori was very challenging, very edifying, but also very instructive. I started my life as a bishop in a context in which the Catholic Church was indeed a small flock. We're a very small minority in the diocese, a Pusillus Greeks. <laughs> I don't understand what he said here. <laughs> we were very much the minority in the community. The overwhelming, overwhelming environment was Islamic, Ilori being one of the very Muslim communities in Nigeria. At the same time, however, there was plenty of scope for ecumenical interaction with Christians of other denominations, both mainstream churches and the African instituted churches. As a bishop and missionary, there was no lack of opportunities for primary evangelization, especially in certain zones of the diocese where the people, the native people, were very open to adopting the Catholic faith and had decided to, to reject Islam. It was an exciting task leading such people from their attachment to their traditional religious practices to the embrace of the Catholic faith. It was also a joy seeing their number grow and their Christian faith deepen. It was six years of exciting growth in the Episcopal life. And then in 1990, I was transferred as coadjutor bishop of the federal capital, Abuja, where I now are. That is where I have been until now for now almost 25 years, leading a diocese that is growing with the rapid development of a new city. Uh, Abuja is a new capital of Nigeria. Before 20 years ago, it was, the capital was in Lagos. 20 years ago, the government moved the capital to, to Abuja, which was out of virgin land, completely new city. Come and see wonders, you are all invited. As federal capital and the seat of government, the role of the bishop and later as archbishop was necessarily connected with state affairs. There is also relationship with people outside the church in terms of ecumenical contacts with other Christian communities, as well as interfaith relations with a strong but not dominant Muslim influence. One good lesson I have learned is that the common values of humanity far outweigh 
our not insignificant differences. This is a firm basis for our hope and determination for living in peace and harmony with all. I have to thank God for the experience of religious leadership that I have enjoyed in the course of my lifetime that is now drawing to a close. I am over 70. I'm 71. I've finished the sum of our years. If I'm strong, I will reach 80. I don't know yet. But so far, I thank God. I have had leadership role within the Catholic Church on the national level, on the regional level, continental level. I was president of the bishops of Africa a long time. And on the global level, I have been called by the Church of God to participate, especially in the synods of bishops in Rome. Ecumenically, I have been involved in the, in the, in the local level with Christian Association of Nigeria, which I headed, and I have also had a wonderful experience with the World Faith and Other Commission of the World Council of Churches, ecumenism, multilateral ecumenism at the highest level. Let me conclude now, because I'm trying to understand what paper they brought here. <laughs> Conclusion. I can say that having learned to live in openness to others, I have had no reason to regret the fact that I give everybody the benefit of the doubt, respecting those who differ from me, while at the same time making clear the position that I hold according to how I understand the will of God for me. My participation at a meeting of this nature is just one out of such opportunities to contribute towards our ever-growing world development and growth in greater mutual relationship and understanding between people of different faiths. Our humanity has reached a stage where there is no option than to seek ever closer positive relationship. The alternative is clearly disaster as we can already see all around us. I pray that we will continue to see progress in this line and that we might even see great changes within my own lifetime. Each one has his or her own sacred history, but the journey of humanity continues. As a Christian, I believe that this journey is heading towards a divinely determined target when God will be all in all. Thank you very much. <laughs>